Hey everyone, Dr. Hanisha here. Thank you so much for joining me for my podcast, Mahan Health with Dr. Hanisha. Mahan literally translates to great in Sanskrit, and it only makes sense to have the absolute best when it comes to your health. My goal is by you listening or watching this podcast, you're getting just a little bit closer to achieving Mahan or great health yourself. This podcast is all for you, so please make sure to comment what you'd like to learn more about so I can get a guest on the show who's an expert in that field, or I might even talk about it myself. I am seeing patients and clients all over the world virtually, so make sure to book your free 15-minute phone call today to see how you can start achieving Mahan or great health yourself. All right, let's get right into the episode for today. Today's episode, I had the opportunity to interview an esteemed colleague of mine, Dr. Ben Reeves, and we talk all about the seven laws of healing. His book is on this exact topic, and it is profound. I'm telling you, I love that he brings in history because for those of you who know me and have been listening to my podcast, you know that I absolutely love history and ancient philosophy and ancient wisdom because those are the roots of our medicines today and where we all came from. So I love learning about it, and I'm excited for you to hear I'm excited for you all to hear a little bit more from Dr. Reeves himself, but let's talk a little bit more about Dr. Reeves. Who is he? Um, He is actually an award-winning naturopathic physician and the founder of Portland Clinic of Natural Health, which is an integrative medicine clinic that specializes in helping to resolve chronic disease with natural medicine. He is the author of the highly acclaimed book, The Serpent and and the Butterfly, The Seven Laws of Healing. He is recognized as a leading expert in mind-body healing and alternative medicine, awarded as one of Portland's top medical providers by Portland Monthly in 2019 and 2020. And he has appeared on AM Northwest, Pain-Free and Strong, The Spa Doctor, Love is Medicine, and more. Uh, He is a member of the American Association of Naturopathic Physicians, the Oregon Association of Naturopathic Physicians, and an active volunteer for for the Naturopathic Medicine Institute. He currently lives in Portland, Oregon with his wife, Maria, and in his free time, he enjoys spending time with his family, songwriting, cooking, and traveling the world. I'm so excited for you all to hear this podcast. Dr. Reeves is amazing. He's such a such an amazing soul. Um, but um, but I'm going to let you get straight to the episode and listen to everything that he has to offer. Um, make sure to leave a, a review and rate the podcast and let us know what you thought of this episode and then reach out to Dr. Reeves or myself after the show. All right. Enjoy. Hello, Dr. Reeves. How are you doing today? Hi, thanks for having me, Dr. Hanisha. Yeah, of course. I'm so excited to have you on. Um, I love everything that you're doing. I love seeing your content on Instagram. That's obviously, I mean, I feel like my followers, um, my listeners know that I'm always on Instagram. So <laughs> I really appreciate everything that you're doing on there. Thanks so much. Yeah. Okay. So let's get right into the interview. Uh, tell us a little bit about your journey. Uh, how did you get involved in naturopathic medicine? Yeah, for me, uh, I grew up in the woods off the grid. And uh, Mm -hmm. so from the age of seven to 20, so about 13 or 14 years, I had to pump all of my water by hand. I had to, we had no no running water, no electricity. And we built our house from scratch in the middle of the rainforest. And so, and then we we made everything from scratch. So I, I was cooking and baking from the age of five. And we'd always try to buy organic whenever possible. Uh, And my mother was a nurse at the local hospital, a charge nurse running one of the hospital wings. And so I had this um, connection to healthcare, but also in a very natural kind of setting. And I think that's really where I first kind of got connected to natural medicine. Wow, that is so amazing. I have so many fantasies and dreams about just like living in the woods and (laughs) being one with nature. I feel like one day it will become a thing, but (laughs) that's amazing. That's so exciting. Um, Okay, so speaking of nature, Mm -hmm. you have a book called uh, The Seven Laws of Healing. And so yeah, let's, let's talk a little bit about that. What, well, before we get into the laws of healing, which I feel like are connected to the laws of nature, but um, let's talk a little bit about the laws of nature and then we'll, we'll talk about the integration. Yeah, so I actually use them pr- pretty interchangeably in this book. However, the laws of nature are more um, expansive, more comprehensive, right? So you can include like gravity and things like that. Yes. Uh, the, laws of na- the laws of healing are really 
um, extrapolated from the laws of nature and, and they're, they're laws from nature that we can use to, to stimulate healing in the body. So when you say to stimulate healing within the body, what exactly do you mean by that? I, I know that's like a, a very common naturopathic concept, but I feel like we often lose a lot of our followers when we say that they're like, what does that mean? So yeah, can you help yeah. us understand what that means? Yeah, so it really begins with the first law of healing, which is the law of vitality uh, or the law of the vital force, uh, the V's or the vis medicatrix, which uh, means the healing power of nature. And uh, Hippocrates, the so-called father of modern medicine, about 2,500 years ago coined this expression. And we have, his, we have the Latin, which is the vis medicatrix natura, meaning the healing power of nature, which comes from the Greek. And basically, it's this, it's this innate healing capacity. It's this, this fact, this uh, uh, clinical fact that, that our body is always working to heal itself. It's always working to restore normal structure and function. And an underpinning of it is something called homeostasis. However, it's more than just homeostasis. It's more than just a system or a mechanism that's just keeping balance. It's, it's energetic, it's spiritual, it's emotional, it's physical, it's biochemical. It, 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 it uh, impacts every aspect of life. And we can work with this force or we can work against it. And so there's ways to, to do both. And the laws of healing are all about working with it in order to harness it as a power, in order to get the biggest bang for our buck as, um, as healthcare practitioners and as, as people in the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, so I guess we could say like, yeah, the laws of healing are working with our innate nature or our, our natural ability to heal itself, because that is what our body, our bodies are constantly working to keep us alive and going, you know, and, um, and there are always going to be external pathogens or things that disrupt that, um, that vital force, right? Um, that, that you talked about. There are always going to be things that disrupt that, but our bodies and our minds are constantly working with us to help support us so that we don't experience the well, disease or, um, or anything beyond that. So, so yeah, I guess like when um, we talk about disease, then what would you say would be some what would what would be some causes of dis-ease in our body? So I, I purposely splitting up those um, that word to be dis-ease, so having a lack of ease in our body, so a lack of wellness. And so um, what would you say some causes of that would be? Right, so this is actually a great question because it gets right into the second law, which is the law of disease. And so the first law is the law of vitality, which is that the body is always working to heal itself. The second law is the law of disease and disease according to the founder or one of the founding fathers of naturopathic medicine, Dr. Henry Lindlar, who um, had German heritage and wrote a book called Nature Cure that was published in 1913, so about 107 years ago. Uh, he, in that book, says that all disease is caused by three things. And um, he, he, he used old words to describe it. He said the accumulation of, um, of morbid matter, poisons and toxins. He said the abnormal composition of the blood and the lymph. And he said a devitalized vitality or a weak vital force. So if we translate that into modern functional medicine or naturopathic medicine, uh, we can basically say disease is caused by deficiency, toxicity, and weak vitality. And Dr. Linlar even went on to say, not only is disease caused by these three things, but in fact, it is equivalent with these three things. Now, I, I don't necessarily 100% agree with that. However, it's very interesting to think that these three underpinnings are literally the contributing factors that, that drive disease in the body. And that it, so if, in other words, we can flip that out, 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 outside upon itself or flip it inside out, and we can say that optimal health is not being deficient in vitamins, minerals, and nutrients, being, having adequate repletion of nutrition, uh, and then being um, fairly uh, uh, detoxified uh, in our organs of elimination. In other words, having fully functional organs of elimination like the liver, the kidneys, the skin, the lungs, and so on. And then having energy, having vitality, having all of our mitochondria uh, operating at a really high level. 
And so if we can do those three things, then the vital force is supported and the body will heal itself. If we just get out of the way, the body will do the work. Yeah. And that's, that's all we got to do is get out of our own ways. Right. And we could think about that in so many aspects, I feel like of our lives, right. How often do we have like mental blocks or anxiety or worries that really, if we just got out of our own heads, got out of our own way, we would be okay. Absolutely. Right? And I think that's a part of that vitality uh, for sure. <laughs> Um, okay, so so those were the two two of the laws, um, and what, so what what are, what are I think there are seven laws. Correct. There are correct. seven laws. Seven laws of healing. Okay, so what are some of the other laws? Yeah, so the third law is the law of cure, and this comes from uh, Dr. Constantine Herring, who I believe uh, uh, practiced in the 1920s, 1930s, and he discovered. Um, notice it's all pretty much white males <laughs> mm -hmm. who's, who made these. The thing is, I, I, I just want to make one thing clear. All of these laws, they come from the indigenous peoples. They come from people of all walks, all ethnicities, uh, genders, uh, from all over the world and, and from different traditions. And, and they've been, they, you know, they, the Ayurvedic tradition, the Chinese medicine tradition, African tribal traditions, indigenous healing traditions. They were practicing these laws. They were applying these laws thousands of years ago. And so there is nothing new under the sun. These didn't just come from these white males from the early 1900s. However, they were the ones writing books and you know, coining expressions. Uh, so the, the third law is the law of cure. And this Dr. Hans, Constantine Herring said that cure proceeds in four ways in the body, from the inside out, from the top down, in the reverse order of the symptoms, and from the most important to the least important organs. And he, he had noticed that in his practice and from studying that this was how healing moved. So we as doctors, as, as practitioners, and, and uh, as people experiencing disease, we can observe these in ourselves and we can work with a trained, licensed naturopathic doctor to help us on our healing journey to move in the direction of health and to move in the direction of healing and to look for these signs and symptoms. So that's, that's the third law. It's a little bit more of a difficult one. Yeah. So um, just to clarify with that law, that's where we're understanding these signs and symptoms in our body and realizing that those are signals or messages from, from our body saying that there's something going on and um, that law of cure is kind of like, okay, now we can address that thing going on. Exactly. And it gives us information about whether or not we're moving in the direction of health or in the direction of disease. If okay. a disease begins to penetrate deeper into a more significant organ, like from the, from the skin to the lungs mm -hmm. or, or something like that, then we know that things are getting worse, perhaps. Mm -hmm. Uh, whereas if things move from the lungs to the skin and now um, an asthma goes to just a, an itchy rash, then we know that we're moving in the right direction, perhaps. Of course, we have to work with someone like you and my, or myself, who's a licensed naturopathic doctor, who's we, we've put years and years into this, because this isn't something to go try at home. No, no, definitely not. Okay, well, yeah, thank you. And I really appreciate that you also um, give credit to the indigenous practices of um, in indigenous medicines and people because um, because you're absolutely correct. That really is um, these these people like our the ancient cultures have been practicing this for thousands of years, way beyond modern medicine and um, Hippocrates even right. Um, and so there have been these things that have been occurring, but like a lot of it has been suppressed, and um, you know we won't get all, all into that. Um, but a lot of it has been suppressed, and, and it comes from oppression uh, of culture. But then a lot of it also comes from just the mere fact of more documentation and um, and honestly a lot of <laughs> just taking credit <laughs> oftentimes uh, for for things I mean yeah. we've seen that throughout history when it happens with people of color or women um, like you know even in recent history we've seen how often that occurs and so I do very much appreciate you bringing that up so thank you well, it's interesting you say that because in, in, in my book, you know, The Serpent and the Butterfly, The Seven Laws of Healing, I have a little introduction in there and it's very short, but I actually believe, and I know no one could ever prove this, Dr. Hanisha, but I believe just based on common sense that the first 
integrative medicine doctors were women. And the reason I believe this, um, I don't believe it because I think it's a politically correct thing to believe. I believe it because by virtue of a woman's uh, biology and, and the natural responsibility that ensues, that, uh, and then from all the evidence from reading widely um, uh, about um, indigenous practices from centuries ago, uh, I believe that women, I mean, you know, if a, if a kid came down with a fever, the mother is gonna be the first one to treat it. Or if, and, and so I, I, I know no one could ever prove that and I'm not trying to say, make a, a statement that, you know, yeah. That, but I, I just, I think that really speaks to what you're saying. And this, this credit needs to be given. And I know there's lots of books written about this, like uh, Women Who Run With the Wolves, and various books have been written about this, but mm -hmm. it, this story needs to be told. Definitely, so. definitely. I love that book too. So glad you, it's right on my nightstand right now. <laughs> It's my, my nighttime reading. I love that book. Um, but okay, yeah. So thank you again so much for doing that. Um, you're absolutely right, and I, I really appreciate it. But okay, let's let's keep moving forward. Um, so okay, so we had the law of nature, then law of cure. Um, yes, oh, law yeah. of cure. Okay, and then what what are the next laws? Right, and then we had the law of disease. The fourth law is the law of compensation, and this one uh, comes again from Dr. Henry Linlar. Uh, he said that everything we do to the body, every drug we introduce, produces a primary and a secondary effect. He said the primary effect is always uh, short-lived, it's transient, and we can observe it, um, and then it goes away. And he said the secondary effect um, is always much more long-lasting and persistent, mm -hmm. and it moves in the opposite direction of the primary effect. So we see this a lot in... Um, in, th in different, the, it's the side effects that drugs cause. Um, for example, um, like birth control pills. Birth control pills will um, interfere with ovulation and the gonadotrophins in order to suppress pregnancy. Uh, however, secondarily, uh, they'll, they'll de cause depletions in all the B vitamins, magnesium, selenium, zinc, um, and so on. And then a person, and then many women will end up with all of the chronic diseases associated with those deficiencies, such as hypothyroidism associated with low selenium, uh, muscle cramps, uh, insomnia, things like that associated with no, low magnesium, and so on. And so that would be an example of like the primary effect is to interfere with ovulation, but the secondary effect is this very long lasting nutrient deficiency that drives chronic disease. Um, and so that's maybe a little bit of an esoteric example. But. Yeah, no, I think that's a great example that you use like the primary and secondary effect. And that is, um, I, I really like that law too, because that's something that I, I actually tell um, a lot of my followers, patients, whoever I, I, cause people are always talking about how, as we age, you know, um, I have people in their twenties and thirties who are like, Oh, like I have this pain cause I'm just getting older. And I'm like, no, um, you're still very young. And so I like to say that it's not that we become less resilient as we get older, it's that we're less able to compensate because, because our body is now having that kind of secondary effect of like, okay, like I've been dealing with this for long enough and I've been able to process and just like deal with it so you don't have symptoms. But now, now I'm gonna express symptoms because I can't keep, I can't keep dealing with this anymore. Exactly. I couldn't put it better myself. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. So, um, so we got the law of nature, law of disease, law of cure, law of compensation. And then what are the last? Yeah. Three? So the fifth law is the law of resonance. And um, I, I take this law from physics and particularly from music um, that if you, uh, I, I'm a musician myself, but if you put a violin next to a guitar and you, you pluck one of the strings on the guitar, the violin will begin to vibrate only at the shared harmonics or frequencies of the guitar. And this is known as harmonics. And um, we also use, use this law in medicine. And so there's many different plants, many different um, therapies even that uh, resonate with certain organs, with certain diseases, with certain tissues. Um, and there, uh, there are many examples. I think that like milk thistle would be a good example. Milk thistle really resonates with the kidneys and the liver. Um, and this is also known in old medicine as the doctrine of signatures, using like to treat like. And now science is showing that all of these plants have active properties that, that actually act on those particular organs that indigenous 
peoples have been using for hundreds of years. Mm -hmm. So for example, milk thistle has psil psilibin, um, which is an active compound that um, helps to reduce inflammation and have an action on the kidneys in order to restore normal function to the kidneys. And um, another example would be turmeric. Um, and so anyway, we have, we have um, the law of resonance working and, and homeopathy is actually a pretty good example of the law of resonance. I know a lot of people don't believe in homeopathy or think that it's not a, not an, a, isn't a, isn't a, a therapy that actually has any evidence behind it. However, that's not the case. There are thousands of studies and basically we use potentized remedies that have a resonance with certain patterns in the body. And this is something that the Ayurvedic um, tradition and the Chinese medicine traditions have, are much more apt at using, I think. Uh, so the law of resonance we use as practitioners, and there are also certain therapies that resonate with certain people. So the right diet, the right uh, exercise type may not be right for a certain person, or it may be right for a certain, the right practitioner may be resonate with a certain person. And so that's the law of resonance. Yeah, so that's kind of where the individualized um, plan, you know, just individualizing your care in general, because it doesn't make sense for you to have the exact same, um, like lifestyle and diet and, you know, that as me, because we're completely different. We have completely different upbringings. We have completely different, uh, genetic makeups, right? Um, all yeah. of that is going to change what each of us need. And then also, I think, um, it's also important to note that like, for me, what works for me right now might not work for me tomorrow or um, might not work for me in a month or a few years you know it really just depends on where we are in that stage of life and that's where that i think the resonance really comes in i love what you're saying there and i love the example of the genes because i think that's a great um, example of resonance um, and how our genes can be turned on and off by the environment and we have this whole field of epigenetics that we now um, are learning a lot more about and what's interesting is that resonance can be used for harm as well, because there are certain things that cause dissonance with our genes. There are certain uh, certain anti-nutrients that will actually um, cause damage to our genes and cause dissonance. There are also certain frequencies, certain electromagnetic frequencies that will cause damage, uh, radiation, for example, to our, to our genes and to our bodies. And so resonance can be used um, to hurt as well as to, to, to heal. Yeah, that is a really good point um that it could be both you know it, it could be yeah all right um okay the six are we on number six <laughs> we're on number six yeah the sixth yeah. law is the law of synergy and synergy is is this uh it's this law that um two properties when combined can have a much greater action than just used by themselves we see this in physics um where two active properties um when, when used together um can have a much greater effect on the, on the whole or on the system. And we as naturopathic physicians use this all the time. There are certain herbs we combine. Um, for example, I use gentian and skullcap a lot uh, synergistically for gut health. Um, there's a lot of evidence that black pepper and turmeric work together synergistically. There's a lot of science now behind frankincense and myrrh having antimicrobial synergistic uh, properties when used together. And we all know that frankincense and myrrh have been used for thousands of years. Mm -hmm. um, and so synergy is something that when, when we basically combine several tools, several mm -hmm. modalities in order to have the greatest impact possible on the health of the organism. Yeah, definitely. And um, I love that you brought up the examples of the frankincense and myrrh, as well as turmeric and black pepper, um, or turmeric and like any sort of fat, right? Um, and that's why like, I, I'm Indian. I grew up with Ayurvedic medicine and grew up with uh, drinking the turmeric lattes or golden milk that has become super popular now. Um, but we we would normally drink it with conventional milk or like dairy milk. Um, but the difference was in Ayurveda, the milk was much purer um, than it is, unfortunately, now in the states um and even in india in general like it's still that's actually why cows are considered sacred within hinduism was because of um all the like you know powerful properties that the milk from the cow could give us as humans and so it was like we take care of the cows so that they take care of us too but uh and again that that's that synergistic effect too of like 
with our animals um, or meat or dairy or whatever we're consuming, having that sort of like, like we're, we're supporting one another. We're not just taking it as, as is so much of our culture currently is just like constant taking, 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 taking from the environment, taking from animals, taking from um, others. Um, instead of that, like creating more of a synergistic effect. And I feel like when we start to think like that too, that allows more healing within us. I love that. I, I, we have this, um, this idea of tole totem to treat the whole person. And it's actually the law of synergy. And not only can we treat the whole person like ourselves or, or our patients, treat all the parts, treat the different organs, the emotional, the physical, the mental. Uh, also, we can treat our environment. Just like you said, the environment is part of the whole too. Right. And it's the most synergistic thing a person could do, to look at the whole and not just a part. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And I think that's where a lot of the conventional medicine has kind of lost that um and so we uh, within conventional medicine we become very reductionist and we try to even you know they find with turmeric they're trying to find the most active component uh which is curcumin which of course can still benefit many people but like turmeric as a whole has so many more benefits than just curcumin uh, because there are so many other active components as well uh we're just not studying them and so, and that's what we do with pharmaceuticals in general. So many pharmaceuticals come from plants, um, but we, but we extract them to, to be only one component, but there's so much power and magic, I feel, in that synergy. Yeah. I mean, you use the whole plant and you get a much great, a greater effect and yeah. you get the synergistic multifactorial effect of all these different compounds. And yeah. yeah. And it's so cool that like all these indigenous practices clearly knew that. And that's why they were doing all these things. And we just thought they were rituals like with frankincense and myrrh, right? Like we just thought they were rituals, but like there was science behind it. They knew what they were doing there. They knew there was a connection there and there was synergy. So that is just so cool. Um, okay. So the last law, what is the seventh law of healing? So the seventh law may be the most important law, um, and it's the law of intention. And it's, it's this idea that whatever we persistently attend to, um, we, have an, we, we actually um, have an effect on it, and we can actually do this with our health. Um, it's, it's the intention we set. It's the envisionment that we make about the possibility. And whether one believes it's placebo or not, there are thousands of studies showing the power of intention, the power of... Um, attention and the power of placebo. And so healing really begins with being open to the possibility of getting better. It actually begins with an intention to perhaps take a step in the direction of health. And I, as a naturopathic doctor, can be the, I can take that step before my patient even walks in to see me. And the patient also can take that step. And then when we meet, it has, it has a, a, a an effect that's greater than if we both were just kind of going through our day. I'm like, you know, just another, another patient. Yeah, whatever. Let's just go through the motions. And um, there's nothing wrong with that either. Um, however, when we bring intention to something, we can have a big impact on it. And it's just science. It's, it's nothing woo woo. It's not um, the secret or the law of attraction, or maybe it is. However, it's not some uh, religious spiritual concept I'm bringing. It's actually there's thousands of studies in the evidence-based literature showing the power of our intention. And even, even professional athletes, the greatest athletes in the world, the Olympic athletes, they use the power of intention. The, you know, Tiger Woods using, visualizing his golf stroke mm -hmm. before, before an event. That's intention, mm -hmm. seeing, seeing the, the, the ball go. And, um, and so I can see my patient heal, see them get well. And then if they see that as well, there's a much greater chance we're going to have some beneficial health impact. Um, it's not a, a guarantee that, that there's going to be a cure, but bringing the law of intention is so powerful. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And I love that you do that with every patient because I do the same thing uh, where I'm like visualizing whatever their goals are, right? Like I'm, I visualize and put that intention like, okay, I'm going to help support you in your journey to get to 
that wellness or healing. So I work with a lot of women trying to get pregnant. So I'm like envisioning them being pregnant with a baby and, you know, like (laughs) putting that intention there for them and then telling them to do it themselves too. Right. Like, so if we're, we're all putting in this intention, like you said, the science behind it is there. Um, and one of the other books that's on my nightstand actually right now is, um, you are the placebo by Dr. Joe Dispenza. Um, yeah. And that one has a lot of, a lot of this, the research studies on the, that placebo or intention effect. And, um, I, I like to use the example of like, if we were to just think about a stressful event, we can elicit stress within us. Right. And so if we did the opposite, (laughs) right, if we thought about a peaceful event, just like with meditation, that's what that is, then we could elicit peace within us too. And so when we can do that, we can see just like within that moment, how powerful just the power of intention and our words and our thoughts really are. It's so true. And I think we've all had the experience of going to a doctor and feeling like we were just a cog in the system and Mm -hmm. we were just going to be plugged into their 12 week program and put on their supplement protocol. Mm -hmm. And they didn't even really take the time to get to know us, nor did they, did they really care? Um, They, and, and they just wanted to ring us up and get us on the path. And I think it's easy for all of us, or it's easy for me to fall into that pattern. I mean, I'm not perfect, and this isn't about being perfect. It's just that being in the law of intention, is, it's a totally different thing. Like when I see a patient, my, my intention isn't to get them on my 12-week program. With nothing wrong with a 12-week program, but that may not be the right fit for that patient. They may, they may, may only need two or three visits to see me, and then their hypothyroidism goes away or Mm -hmm. their uh, IBS goes away, or they may need 20 visits with me, or they may only need to see me once, and then I gotta refer them to the right person. Um, And so it's, that's that's intention. My intention is to see my patients get well. And then I end up attracting those types of patients um, because not everybody wants to get well, and there's, and that's okay. (laughs) Yeah, and that's okay. They're not ready for it, right? And so, and that's where it's always about, for us, again, like meeting the patient where they're at. And if they're not ready for that healing, even though sometimes I, I know for myself that can be a difficult thing. I'm like, oh, like I want to support you, <laughs> but I can't do anything about it. You know, I can't, um, and that's okay. That it's not their time. It's not their um, part of their journey yet, um, and and that's it. And that's okay. So, um, and like you said, I do appreciate that you said that. You know, we're not all we're not perfect. You know doing that as often or as much as we can as um is going to really support our patients but then also our patients supporting themselves and that's that's really where it comes in and if you have that power of intention um i talk about this often and i've talked like people who listen to my podcast enough have definitely heard me talk about this but um the power of words is like something i'm super passionate about uh because because we, we what we say and think to ourselves like with this intention, like it clearly has so much of an impact. And so one of the things I've noticed, I'm not sure if you speak any other languages, um, but it is really fascinating that I've noticed in the English language, we tend to embody our emotions. So we say like, I am sad, I am depressed, I am angry. And in most other languages, at least the few that I know of, um, we say I feel, um, or I have feelings of, and and we never say I am for really anything because that would make it more permanent. Whereas I feel is like, this is a temporary feeling and that's okay. Like it's okay to feel and it's totally okay to feel that way, but that's not who you are. And so when you put the I am statement, you're making that your like full on intention for your body. Wow, that's a great point. Yeah, yeah. It's something that I realized one day watching a Bollywood movie and <laughs> I was like, oh my God we do this in English. (laughs) And so I'm very mindful of the words that I speak to myself whenever I say that as well. And I I try to help my patients become more mindful of that too. Just like, Mm -hmm. I never say I am any emotion. I feel emotions. (laughs) Thanks for sharing that. That's really powerful. Yeah, definitely. Okay. So we just got through the seven laws of healing. Was there anything else that you wanted to like kind of tie it all together or anything else that you wanted to mention that we didn't get to? 
I think the only thing else I would say is that I didn't make any of these laws up. I, I had to go read hundreds of books, study all the old literature, study various traditions and systems of medicine, and then I had to go seek out and train with and preceptor with and shadow old doctors, old practitioners who've been using these laws for a long time. Um, and I found after years, uh, several years, uh, that there were only seven and I couldn't reduce it down any further. And I also wasn't able to find an eighth law. So if you find, if you, if you know of an eighth law, let me know. Um, <laughs> because th 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 I did not make any of this up. This is literally coming directly from the thousands and thousands of men and women and practitioners throughout the world. And now we have a lot of evidence behind it. Um, and so that's what's so cool is that we have an evident, an evidential basis for these laws. And I know some of them are a little more woo woo, perhaps or a little bit, have a little bit less evidence than others. Um, however, um, these are very practical laws, very, very practical. Yeah, definitely. And, and that's, I, I do feel like even if it doesn't have like, you know, the conventional evidence behind it, if we think about it in a lot of like common sense or philosophical ways, a lot of them really just make sense, you know, <laughs> and that's the beauty of, of this medicine. <laughs> it's like, it's just, it just makes sense. Um, okay, well, thank you so much. So, so now we're going to get into the rapid fire questions. Um, these, you do not have to answer rapidly. <laughs> just, they're just a little bit quicker questions in general. But um, all right, let's start with the first one. The first one is, what does Mahan Health mean to you? Yeah, I, uh, I had to think about this one a little bit. And um, I love how Mahan also means abundance. Um, as well as greatness, and and I've always I, I look at health as a, a spectrum of potential, and um, and so for me, mahan means a journey. It means a process. Uh, it doesn't mean um, that I'm super healthy and that I'm the best and I'm you know bulletproof. It, it's it's about being on a journey, and it could be a healing journey where I'm down and out, and I'm in the hospital, and I'm mm -hmm. I'm being present to what's going on. Uh, and so Mahan really means about, means presence and abundance, and it means moving along that spectrum of potential wherever I'm at as a person. I like that a lot. Um, that, I, I think that's one of the first times I've heard it explained like that, um, because it, it really is so much about the journey. And I, I love that. Like, that's what real, that's what life is about, right? Like there's no end goal or destination. Um, it's, it's about living in this, very moment and appreciating and um and living in it yeah oh, love that okay so the next two questions could be connected um or it could be the same answer doesn't have to be it's completely up to you um but what was the most difficult health change for you to make and what are you still working on the first one is is simple and yet um I have to say it, it was so difficult. Uh, it was to quit eating dairy for me. <laughs> I, uh, dairy is my, uh, it's my kryptonite and that even includes ghee. Like I can't do bulletproof coffee or ghee without getting symptoms. So it took me probably three or four years once I really learned what dairy does to me personal, personally. This is just about my genetics, my constitution. Uh, and so quitting dairy was the most revolutionary thing ever. I, I, it resolved two chronic diseases in me. Uh, that I'd had since since childhood, and um, yeah, that was the most difficult. The second question, um, can you repeat that one again? <laughs> what are you still working on in terms of your health? Yeah. I think for me that it's mainly uh, how to be healthy in today's world. And uh, for example, um, I know this is going to sound crazy, but just last week, my wife and I put up really good blackout curtains in our bedroom. And I got some really, really good ones um, online uh, that block out all of the uh, light, all the junk light from the street. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, it's profound, but like that was a huge upgrade. And, um, and so that's like an example or like cell phone use, like putting my phone in airplane mode when I'm walking around my neighborhood, like so that the, yeah, just these little things. Um, thinking about mold, like here in the Pacific Northwest, there's a lot of mold and um, I'm, I'm affected by it. So just like 
this gets into the world of biohacking and, and a lot of the things that, mm -hmm. that, that are hot topics today, but I think I've got so much to learn still. And that's, yeah. that's, those are the changes that I need to keep making. Yeah, definitely. And that is so much of like, you know, we, we want to practice and embody so many of these traditional medicines. Um, but then we also have to live in this modern world. So there is that, you know, kind of that dichotomy. And so I appreciate you saying that because I feel like a lot of people also experience that. Also, a lot of people struggle with dairy, including myself, <laughs> removing dairy. I still have dairy on occasion, but um, <laughs> because I haven't been able to fully let it go, but I, it's definitely something that I feel like a lot of people struggle with. So thank you for sharing. Okay. So my last question for you is if you could have a commercial about anything, so like a PSA kind of announcement, what would it be about and why? Yeah, I think it would be along the lines of that we can trust our, our vitality. We can trust um, the healing forces in our body. We can trust our body's ability to heal itself. And we can trust natural medicine. Natural medicine or naturopathic medicine is more safe. It's more effective. And it's actually more readily available than conventional medicine. And I'm not talking about the privileged, like going to Whole Foods and, and eating organic and, and having like a thousand dollars a month to spend on extra supplements. I'm talking more about just the basics of like getting some simple herbs, um, cooking from scratch, be, getting some sunlight, taking a, a walk in the local park, uh, doing, a, doing a home workout in one's gym, even if it's as simple as some push-ups and sit-ups and maybe some yoga. Um, we can trust natural medicine. And we've been taught not to trust it, but that's a bunch of BS. It's absolutely 100% BS. We can trust our own body's ability to heal and we can trust natural medicine. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, we are one with nature, so it only makes sense. Awesome, well, thank you so much. Um, all right, before I let you go, where can people find you? Yeah, uh, you can go to drreebs.com. That's D as in dog, double R, double E, B as in boy, S as in Sam.com. And uh, my book, The Serpent and the Butterfly, The Seven Laws of Healing is available at all the bookstores online, Amazon, Powell's, uh, Barnes and Noble. And you can also buy it off my website, drreebs.com. Okay, awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. We learned so much and um, I'm, I'm so excited to have finally connected with you. So thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Of course. Take care. I hope you all enjoyed that episode with Dr. Reeves and maybe now you have a little bit better starting point for your healing journey. Remember that healing is a journey that is not linear by any means and it is literally that a journey and it's constant. So we're always going through it. So um, I love that these ancient philosophies that Dr. Reeves has put together kind of bring that all in together and kind of bring in all the different types of healing and what is actually essential in order to finally heal thyself. And so I will have Dr. Reeves information in the show notes below. And um, that's all I got for you all today. Thank you so much for joining. And I'm wishing you all such a happy holidays and a very happy and safe new year. Wishing you all Mahan health and sending you all so much love and peace during the season and beyond. And I will see you next time.